reviewing today The Adventures of Tintin, The Broken Ear. So this is the fifth Tintin book in the series. Uh, or actually, it's the sixth because the second book, Tintin in the Congo, is no longer being published in English. But of, of the books still in circulation, this is book number six. Uh, originally published in, sorry, originally serialized in the Belgian newspapers in 1937 and 1938. Uh, I believe the color was added in 1945 in the reprint. Like a lot of the Tintin stories, this one has been revised and republished a few times during the life of the author. I believe the author is pronounced Urge. Uh, yes, and, and this one is no exception. So, uh, most of these Tintin stories see Tintin traveling to an exotic location. And this one sees him going to South America. So there's a fetish that is stolen here. Uh, at, at this point, it might be worth remembering that the original meaning of fetish uh, is an object that people believe has magical powers. Uh, so there, there is one in the museum. It gets stolen. Uh, the uh, two bumbling police twins, the Thompson twins, make a brief appearance, but they do not have... Uh, much to do in this story. Uh, Tintin eventually takes a few pages, but eventually uh, his investigations in it lead him to follow two crooks who are heading to South America trying to uh, get the fetish. Uh, and then Tintin himself ends up in South America, where through some shenanigans, he immediately finds himself accused of spying. Uh, and then there's all of a sudden a revolution. Um, oh yeah, sorry, there, there's, there, there's, this part has made me a little bit funny. Uh, there's a revolution. Uh, general Tapioca has fled. The tyrant is on the run. Our glorious General Alcazar is now in command. And they all cheer, long live Alcazar. And then almost immediately afterwards, the news comes in that Alcazar is gone and General Tapioca is back in command. Uh, long live General Tapioca, down with Alcazar. And during all this time, yeah, so when when the it first comes in, when the message first comes in, he says, in which case you are free, and Tintin says, that suits me. Um, but then when it turns out that the old government is back in, in command, he says, I'm terribly sorry, sir. Well, the way things are, I'll have to carry out my orders and shoot you. Uh, but then there's some sort of problem with the gun. So... Uh, he says, um, you'll have to excuse us, sir. A technical hitch. Will you wait? Would you care for an aperitif? An aperitif? Well, after all, why not? So, so the general gets him uh, drunk. Now, now, this gets back to a question I asked in my previous review. How old is Tintin? According to Wikipedia, he's either somewhere between 15 or 19. Uh, but then, uh, after they drink, he says, Oh, my dear friend, I see my soldiers are back with their rifles. Shall we join them? Only too glad. So Tintin is, uh, drunk at the time he's being let out to be shot. Uh, he says, Boom, doom, I'm dead. Long live General Elkazars. And then, uh, when the rebels come in, he's one of our one of the general's bravest supporters. They had their guns trained on him, and he was still shouting, "Long live General Elkazar!" Uh, so General Elkazar makes him a colonel, uh, and also demotes uh, this other guy uh, down to a uh, corporal. 
uh, because the other guy said we have too many colonels and not enough corporals. So uh, Alcatraz demotes him. So he says, my career is in ruins, but I'll have my revenge on you and that confounded General Alcatra Alcazar. Sorry, I almost said Alcatraz there, but it, it's Alcazar, I believe. So I, sorry, I'm, I'm going through the trouble of, of uh, reading out all those panels to illustrate the flavor of this uh, bit of a bizarre plot, but also it can be quite funny. So then this guy joins some sort of secret uh, club that's trying to overthrow the tyranny of General Alcazar. Uh, although he doesn't really care about tyranny, he's just mad that he got demoted. So uh, from then on, we've got several different things going on here. And it's the classic thing of Tintin just getting out of one danger spot after another. So the disgruntled formal, former army officer is trying to assassinate him. But the two crooks that he met on the boat are also trying to get him. So here's Tintin uh, foiling the disgruntled former armor army officer. And then here's him getting caught by the two crooks that he met on the boat. Um, and escaping from them. And then the disgruntled former army officer again. But then... The uh, American oil wants to uh, corrupt the government, and Tintin won't give in to them. So then they are hiring people to assassinate Tintin. So now we've got three different separate plots here going on. A disgruntled former army officer is trying to get Tintin. The two crooks he met on the boat are trying to get him. And then the assassins hired by the American oil company are... Trying to get him, and the American oil company uh, is able to influence General Alcatraz and turn him against Tintin. So, uh, you know, there's there's still this overarching plot, the the one that kicked off this whole adventure, which is there's this missing fetish from the British Museum, going all the way back here to to page. Two, to remind ourselves of what the plot actually is. Um, but we've largely forgotten about this, and it's just Tintin running from one danger point to another as these stories tend to go. Um, the corrupt, sorry, the disgruntled former army officer, that plot thread comes to a rather abrupt end when after several failed attempts to uh, get General Alcatraz, uh, he is given by his comrades uh, a time bomb. It's set to explode at exactly 11. Now, for some reason, he doesn't want to get there early. Uh, it doesn't say exactly why. Uh, I guess presumably because... Maybe if he got there early, there would be more chance the bomb would be detected before it went off. But for whatever reason, he's, he's trying to wait till uh, 11 exactly. His watch has stopped, so he's going by the clock here. But, unbeknownst to him, there's a power cut this morning, so all the municipal clocks have stopped. Go and put them right. So he doesn't realize it's actually 11. And then right at the moment they fix the clock, then he realizes it's 11. And then, boom. And that is the end of that plot thread. It is never mentioned again. Uh, except there is one thing in between those two panels here, a little ironic thing. Uh, so the, uh, the other is for Corporal Diaz, my former aide-de-cant. I've made him a colonel again. He can resume his duties at once. So he was just about to get rehabilitated back to his old job. And he accidentally blew himself up. Um, so a little bit of um, dark humor there. But, uh, but yeah, that is, that is abruptly the end of that plot thread. 
Now, the other thing I mentioned just briefly in passing was the American Oil Company. Uh, what was the name of it? Yeah, General American Oil, which I, I assume is not a real company, but made to represent American oil companies. And they're trying to get uh, this country, which is, what, what is the name of this country? I forget. There, there's a couple of fic fictional uh, countries. So they want them to go to uh, war with Nuevo Rico over the Gran Chapa region, which presumably has oil in it. Sorry, not presumably, which which the uh, American businessman has said has oil in it. Um, now, I didn't know in, about this until reading Wikipedia, uh, but this was actually a real war. Um, sorry, this was... The Tintin is all completely fictional, uh, with fictionalized countries, etc. But it is inspired by a real war which took place in the 1930s between uh, Bolivia and Paraguay over a region in between them, which I forget the name of it, but it was something similar to Gran Chapo. There's, you know, some sort of pun going on here. Uh, sorry, I'm, is pun the right word? Uh, it's, it's a similar name to Gran Chapo, so whatever the real name was. Uh, and that, yeah, that was a, a war that went on between Bolivia and Paraguay uh, for mi for five years in the 1930s over this region. Uh, and then the other thing that Wikipedia pointed out to me is there's another character, Basil Bazaroff, who's a corrupt arms dealer, as he has on his card. Uh, and he is based on a real person who has a similar name, and I forget what the guy's real name is, it, it was Basil something, uh, a Greek guy, uh, who uh, was known as the Merchant of Death and uh, sold a lot of weapons to uh, countries going to war and would often sell to both sides of the conflict. Uh, and uh, the, guy, the real guy he's, this is based on, there's a picture on the Wikipedia page if you go to that i mean yeah the way to find this is go to the wikipedia page for tin tin the broken ear first and then read the historical research behind that section and then follow the links there and you'll find this guy's picture uh looks very similar to him so it's based on a real guy who uh i i think was still living when this comic came out but you know he he uh he sells arms to one side here, and then he gets on the plane and he goes and he sells arms to the other side. And apparently there was a real guy who was doing things like that at the time. Uh, so that's, uh, I guess, some comments on real life politics uh, and personalities that were going on. Um, although to the best of my knowledge, and the best of my knowledge is the brief research I did on Wikipedia. I, I, I don't, I couldn't find anything about the American oil companies directly uh, instigating the, that war. Um, I mean, the, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm sure the American oil companies were up to something in the region at that time, but <clears throat> I, that might be just uh, Urge's commentary on the way the uh, American and European oil companies more generally were acting. I'm, I'm not sure there's anything more specific he was alluding to. If there is, I, I couldn't find it on Wikipedia. Um, some of the same gags get reused uh, here. And when I say reused, I mean reused from the previous adventure. So the idea of Tintin uh, driving the car off the cliff, but then not actually being in the car, hiding and, and grabbing the car of the people who uh, chased him, that was definitely in the previous, uh, previous books. I, th I think it might even have popped up a couple times. I don't remember. Definitely popped up once. 
Uh, Tintin in front of the firing squad getting saved at the last minute. That was definitely in uh, at least one of the previous books. So uh, some of these scenarios are getting repeated over some of the books. Um, but some of them are new. Like uh, going over the waterfall or almost going over the waterfall. I, I think this is a new one. So Ur Urge was repeating himself a bit, but, but also getting some new adventures. Uh, so Tintin uh, goes in to the jungle eventually to find the tribe uh, where this fetish is from. Uh, oh, and he, he finds an a explorer here. And again, according to Wikipedia, this is based on a real person, a real British explorer uh, with a slightly different name who did disappear in the, in the jungles at the time, who was looking for the lost city of Z. Uh, in the 1920s or something. Uh, so that's that's where the inspiration for this guy is. Now, the, the previous uh, book I was just talking about, Tintin and the Blue Lotus, um, the author, Urge, was trying to uh, correct ignorant Western stereotypes about China. Um, in this book, though, he doesn't seem to be that concerned with correcting stereotypes. Uh, he's, he's uh, you know, talking about the shrunken heads and uh, the, the, I don't know, sacrificing uh, and the natives and stuff like that. Uh, and, yeah, the, the, the magic totem poles. Um, I'm not sure how accurate these stereotypes are are or not. I'm, I'm assuming they're largely caricature. I don't know. Um, I, I don't want to complain about this too much, though, because this is a 1930s comic book jungle adventure. So, you know, you 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 get what you pay for here. Huh? You, you, you would expect this to have the common stereotypes from 1930s jungle adventure genres, and it does. So I, I'm, I'm not complaining necessarily, just pointing it out. Um, oh yeah, even including uh, piranha stuff. Uh, uh, he's finished. Look, Alfonso, these piranhas, uh, these man-eating fishes, they come for him already. Sorry, that was my best. That was my best try at, at, at reading that dialect, um, which actually made me think when I was reading this, I remember when I was a kid, you know, seeing lots of uh, stuff about piranhas and movies and TV shows and adventure books. And I wonder how, ch it, it got me thinking, I got me thinking, I, I should look piranhas up on Wikipedia. Uh, how, how true is this myth that they would, you know, skin you alive in 30 seconds or whatever, eat you down to the bone? And then I forgot to look it up on Wikipedia. It's all right. I, I spend way too much time looking stuff up on Wikipedia anyways. But anyway, uh, w one of the things that does stand out about this being a 1930s adventure is Tintin is back visiting the original tribe and he cracks the mystery. He, he, he finds out that... The reason everyone is looking for the fetish is because one of the tribe's sacred stones has been uh, stolen from them and put in the fetish. Um, but having discovered this, uh, he just wants to go back to Europe and return the fetish to the museum. He does, he does not, it never crosses his mind to return the sacred stone to the tribe uh, that it was uh, taken from. He, he wants to bring it back to the museum. Fair enough, I guess that was the mindset in the 1930s, huh? So he's back in Europe, a few more adventures, finds a crook with the stone, and then th there's an interesting thing here. He finds the crooks, 
They're fighting over the stone. They fall in the river. Tintin gets rescued. But the other crooks just go to the bottom. And then it says, the, the others went straight on down. And then look at the next panel. They are being dragged off to hell by demons. So, uh, haven't, haven't seen that before in these Tintin books. Uh, you know, I, I guess that, you know, the, the author, Urge, was a devout Catholic. So, uh, I guess that's where that imagery comes from. Uh, the Wikipedia article does comment on this. Um, Although it's a little bit confusing uh, what Wikipedia was saying on this. Uh, so Herge was, Herge, sorry, I believe the author's name is pronounced Ur, Urge, something like that, Urge. Anyways, he, he, he was asked to revise this, um, but I'm not quite, it, it's unclear from the Wikipedia article what he revised it to. Apparently in one edition of this, according to Wikipedia, Tintin, the panel is replaced by Tintin and Snowy uh, interceding with God for the souls of these criminals or something like that. Um, but yeah, th this, is, this is the panel that's in the edition that I have. huh? So I, I guess that's, that's all I can really talk about is, is what's in front of me. I, I can't talk too much about the history of how this got revised through the years. Yeah, and then ends up back in the museum. So, uh, yeah, what else to say about this? I mean, like a lot of these, like all of these Tintin adventures, there's just a lot of stuff that happens. Every few pages, Tintin gets into a jam, and then he gets out of it. So there's driving through the mountains. There's... The waterfall, there's the jungle, there's the canoe down the jungle. Uh, it's just you know, a lot of stuff in here. But uh, I think I think I've talked about most of the stuff I need to talk about. So this is Tintin and the Broken Ear. I'm going back. I'll, I'll be back with the Black Island on the next video.